What could Land Rover do to defend its defender against a copycat? My name is Andre Minkoff. I'm the founder of Trademark Factory. And in this video, I'll share my thoughts about yet another trademark screw up. This time around, it's Ineos announcing an off-roader that looks suspiciously similar to Land Rover's Defender. Did Land Rover just majorly screw up? Keep watching and find out all about it. Ineos, one of the largest chemical companies in the world, founded by Sir Jim Ratcliffe, made headlines in July of 2020 with its announcement of Ineos Grenadier, an almost perfect lookalike of the old-fashioned Land Rover Defender. But let me take you back a little first. In 2015, Jaguar Land Rover, or JLR for short, announced that after 67 years, it was ending production of the iconic Land Rover Defender. British billionaire Jim Ratcliffe, a big fan of everything that moves, and in particular, a big fan of old Land Rovers, saw an opportunity. He reached out to JLR and asked if he could get the old Defender tooling and also if he could buy the rights to carry on making it. JLR said no. So Radcliffe decided to create his own Defender style off-roader instead. It's called Ineos Grenadier, named after the pub in London where Radcliffe came up with the idea. The Grenadier in Belgravia. Jager Land Rover attempted to prevent the launch of the Grenadier and started legal proceedings in the UK. Now, hard to blame them since with its flat top fenders, round headlines, angular sides and near flat glass, the Grenadier certainly looks more like the original Defender than the new 2021 Land Rover Defender does. And then it turned out that JLR had never gotten around to trademarking the shape of the original Defender back in the day. And its recent attempts to get it trademarked in the UK have faced some major challenges. Actually, let's go through JLR's UK trademark applications where they try to protect the shape of the Defender. We can break them into several groups. First, there are a few 3D trademark applications that JLR filed in December of 2016 that were supposed to protect individual parts of the Defender. We've got one for the radiator grill, Here's one for the front and the hood. Here's one for the windows and the roof. Here's another one for the windows and the roof. Here's one for the front view. Here's another one for the front view with wheel arcs. And here's one for the back view. All these marks were filed in December of 2016 and then withdrawn on May 30th, 2018. We don't know why they were withdrawn. My guess is the trademarks office rejected them for not being distinctive uh, enough to be registered as trademarks. So they were withdrawn. Then we have a bunch of 3D marks for the overall shape of the car filed between May and September of 2016. We've got all these different models that JLR attempted to protect as 3D trademarks. All these marks were opposed on August 11th of 2017 by no other than, you guessed it, Ineos. Then we have one lonely 3D mark filed by JLR four days before its other marks were opposed. They filed it on August 7th of 2017. Now this one was also opposed by Ineos on August 10th, 2018. On October 3rd, 2019, the UK Intellectual Property Office rendered a decision regarding all these six oppositions. In it, it was revealed that the UK Trademarks Office first issued office actions against these applications, alleging that the shapes were considered to be descriptive of an SUV and devoid of any inherent distinctive character. Now, JLR then submitted evidence that the marks had acquired a distinctive character through long use in trade. The registrar accepted the evidence and published the applications for opposition purposes. This is when Ineos opposed the marks on several grounds. 
Now, the first three grounds pretty much relate to the same thing, just worded differently. In so many words, Aeneas was claiming that the marks were devoid of any distinctive character and were not capable of distinguishing the vehicles of JLR because similarly shaped cars could be made by just about anybody. Uh, the fourth ground relied on the functionality doctrine, stating that the shape of the Defender resulted from its nature as an SUV and was necessary to achieve a technical result. In other words, the shape was dictated by functionality and wasn't purely about distinguishing SUVs of JLR from SUVs of every other manufacturer. The fifth ground was that registration of the Defender shape would somehow be contrary to public policy. And finally, as the nail in the coffin, the sixth ground was that JLR filed the applications in bad faith, since in 2016, when it filed the applications, it had no intention to use the mark to make the old Defender. Remember, JLR announced in 2015 that it would end production. You can read the whole decision following the link below. It's lots of fun to read, but let me summarize it a little here. There is some great discussion comparing the Defender with Mercedes G-Wagon, Mitsubishi Pajero, Santana PS10, Jeep Wrangler, Daihatsu Taft, and Toyota J70, all showing traits similar to the Defender. JLR attempted to focus on distinctions between these models while Aeneas was arguing that it wasn't about the differences, but more about similarities. And then surveys and expert opinions came into play, convincing the opposition board that because a significant number of people thought that the shape of the Defender was actually a Jeep, the shape did not sufficiently distinguish JLR's Defender from SUVs of other manufacturers. So. Therefore, the first three grounds of the opposition succeeded. The opposition board agreed that the boxy shape of the Defender was not necessary to achieve a technical result. And if anything, it went against today's automotive design standards because among other things, such shapes are likely to be inefficient in terms of fuel consumption. Therefore, Aeneas's functionality doctrine argument failed. The public policy argument was quickly rejected as well because while the dispute was important to the parties, there was barely any threat to a fundamental interest of society if the marks were registered. The bad faith, no intention to use the mark argument was also rejected because JLR was able to prove that while they were no longer planning to manufacture all shape defenders on Moss, they did have plans for limited edition runs as well as they were planning to continue selling and servicing their already manufactured cars. So the last three grounds of opposition were turned down, but the first three succeeded. As a result, all JLR's applications were refused. JLR later attempted to appeal the decision in the UK courts, but that challenge failed in August of 2020. The court confirmed that the shapes that JLR sought to get protected were not distinctive enough when compared to shapes of other SUVs. Which brings me to the fourth and last group of trademarks that JLR filed in June of 2020. Now they're trying to trademark the shape of the new 2021 Defender. And these applications are still under examination at the time I'm shooting this video. So we don't know if the UK trademarks office will approve them. And if yes, whether Ineos would oppose those as well. Uh, it's probably likely that the UK trademarks office will reject them. And if they approve them, then Ineos would uh, oppose. Pretty logical assumption to me, but we'll see. Uh, having said that, it's interesting to note that JLR does own the registered trademark to the shape of the old Defender in the US. JLR filed it in December of 2016 and Aeneas never opposed it. So it became registered in May of 2018. Moreover, JLR filed another application in the US in December of 2017 and it was also registered unopposed in July of 2019. Now this raises a few interesting points. Now, first of all, did Aeneas lawyers overlook JLR's trademark applications in the US? The answer to that is probably no, they didn't. Aeneas 
did request an extension of time to oppose the first mark back in November of 2017 and the second mark back in February of 2019. But they never initiated formal opposition proceedings against either mark. JLR sold almost 95,000 Land Rovers in the US in 2019. By comparison, there were 76,000 Land Rovers sold in the UK. I mean, isn't Ineos planning to bring the Grenadier to the US as well? It's hard to see why Ineos would make it easier for JLR to thwart Ineos' marketing efforts by allowing JLR's trademarks to be registered giving JLR the presumption of ownership and validity of their 3D marks in the US that they could use against Ineos. The only logical explanation I can find is that Ineos and JLR made a pact pursuant to which Ineos will not oppose or attempt to invalidate JLR's trademarks in exchange for a license from JLR that will allow Ineos to safely bring the Grenadier to the US. But why would JLR agree to this two years before they were handed a final refusal of their 3D marks in the UK. It's really a weird situation because it's equally hard to imagine that Ineos would forget not once but twice to initiate formal opposition proceedings after the extension of time to oppose that were granted expired. Assuming there is no secret arrangement between the two companies, the next question is, would JLR sue Ineos for trademark infringement if Ineos decides to bring the Grenadier to the US? And if the answer to that question is yes, then of course the final question is, how would the litigation go? Would JLR be able to prevent Ineos from selling Grenadiers in the US and get a massive monetary compensation? Or would Ineos be able to invalidate JLR's trademarks essentially on the same grounds that they were able to successfully oppose JLR's trademarks in the UK. If the case goes to court in the US, it will be very interesting to see whether registration of a three-dimensional configuration of an automobile as a trademark can prevent other manufacturers from building similar cars. And of course, the next question would be, how similar would such other cars need to be for the trademark to be able to prevent them from being sold in the US? Now, it would be captivating to watch. And one final remark is that while JLR was able to trademark the shape in the US, they never even bothered trademarking it in Canada. With 14,000 Land Rovers sold in 2019, Canada might not be JLR's largest market, but it's still fascinating to try and figure out how these decisions are being made, why they file trademarks in some countries, not some others, while they oppose trademarks in some countries, but not others. It's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So that's all I got for you. Please like this video if you found it entertaining, educational, and useful, and make sure you subscribe to get notified when we publish more videos about trademarks, branding, entrepreneurship, and intellectual property. And if you've seen my previous trademark screw-up videos, I'm sure you noticed that this video is a lot more scripted, a lot more produced, and a lot less improvised. So. I'd really appreciate if you could post it in the comments below which approach you like better. Do you like more scripted, more uh, uh, third-party footage, you know, more produced and less improvised, or would you prefer, you know, what we used to do before when I would just read an article and uh, provide my comments as I read the article? So, like I said, post the comments below. Really, really appreciate your opinion, and then we'll see what we're gonna do about it. And until then, I will see you in the next video. Yeah.